Greetings and welcome to this special edition of Campus Conversations. I'm Dan Mogulov from the Campus Office of Communications and Public Affairs. As the Delta variant of the COVID-19 virus continues its rapid spread, case numbers among both the vaccinated and the unvaccinated are on the rise. As our concerns and confusion about what exactly is now required to provide protection for ourselves, our families, friends, colleagues, and fellow citizens. As has been the case since the pandemic began, we are extremely fortunate to have our very own in-house public health experts and clinicians whose advice and guidance have been a source of clarity. And so I'm pleased to welcome today the following panelists. Dr. Guy Nicolette is the Assistant Vice Chancellor and Leader of University Health Services. Dr. Anna Hart is a Medical Director at University Health Services. Professor Arthur Reingold, who's also an MD, is the Chair of the Division of Epidemiology at our School of Public Health. And John, Professor John Schwartzberg, also a doctor, is with the Division of Infectious Diseases and Vaccinology, also at our School of Public Health. We already have a large number of questions that have already been submitted, and you are welcome to post additional questions to our Facebook Live site, where this is being streamed as we go along. We'll do our best to get to all of them. Folks, I wish I could say it was good to see all of you again. I think this is the uh, third event we've done since the beginning of the pandemic. And I want to start just by going around the room, starting with you, John, about where do you think we are right now? Are we on the verge of something far more dangerous and dark than we currently think? Or is this an anticipated bump in the road? Where are we? What do you think? Well, we're, we're with a new animal. There's no question about that. But I think we understand this new animal pretty well. Um, we've learned an awful lot in a very short time about its nature in terms of its interactions with us. So I feel like we're not dealing with the unknown in terms of how we're going to how we need to respond to this um, Delta variant. What does concern me is how well we will respond to it. Why are you concerned about that? Let me follow up really quickly. Well, I, I'd say the number one thing is just how difficult it is to get a large chunk of our population vaccinated. The resistance to that is very disappointing. And the lack of really good leadership in too many parts of our country uh, that just exacerbates the problem. Thanks. We're going to come back and talk more about many of the things that you just touched upon. But um, Art, let me come to you uh, from, an again, an epidemiologist's point of view. What's happening right now? What are you seeing? Well, um, as I think many people know, right now we, we continue to have a very heterogeneous world and country with regard to uh, COVID-19, uh, but, but more specifically here in California and in the Bay Area, uh, we have seen recent increases in, in COVID-19. Um, for the most part, they have shifted uh, more to a younger age group uh, because that's who's unvaccinated. As the director of CDC said, we currently have an epidemic or pandemic, if you will, among the unvaccinated. And that's largely true. Uh, and so um, not to say we don't have occasional uh, uh, what called vaccine breakthrough uh, cases, but 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 we we really I think the indication of what all that tells us is we need to do an even better job of communicating the safety and, and effectiveness of the vaccines uh, and continue to achieve high levels of coverage because a combination of vaccination and 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 masking and other social distancing behaviors is what's going to keep us safe and and get us out of this. Thanks. Um, Guy, I'm going to shrink this down now to the campus context. What's happening on campus? Are we reevaluating all of our plans? How are, how are we doing in terms of vaccinations? How set up are we? How well set up are we for what's happening right now? Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, well, let me just start by saying I'm sure most of my answers from a campus perspective are not going to satisfy everybody. Um, I, we are continuing to base our response on uh, existing science and, of course, um, expert opinion, like the two, the, the two folks we have here in Art and John, and, and under capable leadership of, of uh, Dr. Hart. That said, kind of from a, from a campus perspective, I, I'm, I'm holding a couple things. One is our vaccination rate exceeds that of, um, of certainly of the, the national average and, and, and even in the local population. 
what we're what we have right now is a campus that looks like it's about 80 to 85 percent vaccinated if you take it as a sum and then if you're splitting up parts we we have some um, groups that are uh, approaching 90 percent that doesn't mean we're done you start to do the math and that's still thousands of people that are that are unvaccinated and as Art mentioned, that those are the folks that are most likely to, to be infected and then, of course, spread it. Um, is there one single policy? Is there one single thing that we're going to do that's going to eradicate everybody's risk? No. So we're going to have to continue to, to advocate for vaccinations for those folks that have not, not yet been fully vaccinated. We're going to have to think about how we use the other mitigation strategies like masking, distancing, all these other things that we've learned to do and have, have done, frankly, quite effectively on the campus for, for most of the, you know, the better part of 18 months. I'll stop there because I know we're going to talk about a lot of these things. We are, but I, I want to follow up for a second. And sorry, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Would you say we're in a state of flux just a couple of weeks away from the start of instruction? Um, do you feel like there's still balls up in the air in terms of policy decisions um, because of the extent to which things are sort of changing under our feet at the moment? Yeah, I do think there are some balls in the air. I think the, the, the bigger issues, meaning are we going to have in-person classes? Yes, that is the plan. Are we going to offer in for, for university health? Are we going to see patients in person or continue remote? Well, we're going to do both. So I think there's some, some basic fundamental things that we, we know to be true, but, but there are certainly some policy decisions about folks that have not, uh, you know, that, that need advanced accommodations or that, you know, have some other existing thing that we really haven't had to, to grapple with as much um, prior to Delta. Got it. Um, Arne, let me just come to you now and sort of complete this first round. From a cl clinician's point of view, what else would you want to add here? Make sure people understand and know. Well, I think the very first thing is that we've learned an enormous amount over the last year, year and a half, not just in terms of new skills and, and the importance of certain protective activities, but we've learned how to pivot, how to change, how to evolve, how to continually look at what we're doing to make sure that it's um, essentially evolving to meet whatever the virus throws us. Um, and we're not done with that and we won't be done with that, I would suspect, frankly, ever, but certainly for the next couple of years. Um, here at UHS, we have, you know, tested hundreds of thousands of people. We've cared for hundreds of people with COVID. We've talked to an enormous number of contacts. We've learned a lot about people's behaviors, their risks, how they handle it, how they respond, the mental health impact. And we, we, are, we will continue to apply that knowledge over this coming year. That serves us really well as we have so many people coming back to campus, some of whom have not been here, many of whom have not been here, and many of whom may be coming from areas that are very different from the Bay Area in terms of the expectations that we have here. So I'm looking to this coming year to apply and continue to apply everything we have learned to continue to evolve and pivot and change. We are literally doing it weekly still here at UHS in terms of our workflows from an infection control perspective. And to remember the good news as well as the difficult news and the good news being that these vaccines, why they may not be perfect, are incredibly good vaccines. They are, they are a miracle, frankly, in what they were able to achieve in the time that they were able to achieve it. And they will change as well with us it's just that we're tired. And I just want to acknowledge that people are tired now. It's been a long haul. And it, I think for a little while, a month ago, we thought we might be coming out of it. Um, and, and we're not. We're not as much out of it as we thought. And so that's really, I think, the biggest challenge that we're facing is pandemic fatigue and, and making sure that we give ourselves the, the space to um, be compassionate and to, and to look at this from a science-based perspective of what we should be doing and changes we need to. So I'm, I'm curious, given that you're sort of boots on the ground in the clinical sense, um, are you getting questions from people who've been vaccinated? Like, why do I need to be tested if I'm vaccinated? What are, what are the kind, kind of questions you're seeing that at UHS from students, staff, and faculty? We're seeing a lot of questions. Um, I'd say recently the, the, I, the silver lining of Delta is that people are suddenly paying more attention again, and they're asking really good questions. They're returning our phone calls. Um, they include everything from, 
you know, do I need to worry? I've already had it. And, you know, there's some good reports out there. Yes, you can catch COVID several times potentially, although we don't really know the extent of that. Um, we're still hopeful that some level of immunity does protect you against severe disease. But one of the reasons we need to keep testing vaccinated people to some degree is so that we can continue to learn, so that we can um, do, do what we need to do to stay on top and ahead of the variants that are emerging, because we are sequencing our positive cases to make sure that we get um, keep a, a finger on the pulse of the severity of disease. So for example, anybody who's hospitalized with COVID, I hear about it. I'll go in, I'll look and see what variant they had, what vaccines they had. I'm speaking with the public health officer every week to inform their response as well. So it's part of the data collection that informs the response on the ground. Got it. Um, Art and John, let me toss this question to both of you and jump in as you see fit. Uh, from an epidemiological point of view, should the advice be to people who are vaccinated, just pretend you're not, go back to operating and rolling through your life the way you were prior to the vaccines, you know, double masking at times, social distancing. Um, what does the epidemiology tell us about how we should be rolling now, how the vaccinated should be rolling, I should say? So uh, maybe I'll take a crack at it first, John, yes. and then you can uh, correct all the things I say that are wrong. Um, so, um, you know, we've already alluded to, and as Anna said, the virus is still here. Uh, the virus is not going away anytime soon. It, it will almost certainly evolve further, uh, new variants and the like. Um, so, so I don't think we can simply say we're done with this virus or will be in, in, in the coming months. Um, you know, I think that that fundamentally, uh, I think uh, we vary in terms of our own risk taking and risk perception. Uh, but but just to say when I'm out and about uh, going to the Berkeley Bowl or to the cheese board or to some of the other famous places people like to go to in Berkeley, um, you know, I, I see fairly rational approaches to trying to reduce risk uh, in terms of masking uh, and separating people. Um, I, I'm my, obviously myself vaccinated and, and believe the vaccine offers a good degree of protection and I wear my mask. Um, uh, other people might say, well, I'm really worried I'm, I'm not going to do X, Y, or Z. Um, but but I, I think that generally, um, you know, if you are vaccinated and, and, and exercising reasonable precautions and masking and the like, uh, that you can really go back to a reasonable life. Uh, in the community, but but perhaps not quite the wild bar scenes and, and 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 the like that some people like to engage in. So, John, I'm going to come to come to you in a second. But Art, I want to follow up. So let's extend that a little bit. It's one thing to go into a grocery store, whether it's Berkeley Bowl or Monterey Market, um, and everybody's masked up. You're in there for a little while, but. I've received some email from faculty prior to this event and they're concerned about standing in a small classroom. If there's concerns about hearing and being audible and all the rest, but just from a health perspective, would you feel comfortable giving a lecture in a relatively small room to 30 students seated around the table, even if everybody's vaccinated and masked up? So the quick answer is yes, I, that's my plan. I teach three courses this fall and I'm planning to teach them all in person. They range in size between about 25 and 45 students. And I'm planning to teach them all in person in the classroom uh, with everyone or virtually everyone vaccinated and, and people wearing masks. My own view is that you can do that um, with a high level of safety, but of course, nothing in life is perfect. Uh, and, and we have always had infectious disease risks in the community. That's why we want people vaccinated against measles and meningitis and influenza and a host of other diseases. Got it. John, I, I want to come to you now and just fill in behind, and then I've got a question for you. Anything you want to add to what Art had to say? Well, I do. Um, you know, Art, Art lives much more on the edge than I do. <laughs> <laughs> We've joked about this since the beginning of the pandemic. And... Um, I actually agree with everything he was saying um, up, up to the point about classrooms. But you know, your original question, Dan, had to do with really holding two truths. Yeah. And you know, one truth is that these vaccines are incredible. As Anna said, they're, they're, they're truly miracles. They, they far exceeded anybody's expectations in terms of how well they work. 
So I feel incredibly protected. So I feel very secure having been fully vaccinated. And even though I got my last jab was at the end of January, I still feel protected right now. So they, 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 they have given me, a, they put me in a very different place than I was this time last year in terms of seeing the world and how I interact with it. On the other hand, there's another truth. And the truth is that the vaccines aren't perfect. Um, they, they, they approach it, but they're not perfect. And we talked earlier about breakthrough infections. Um, there's been the concern, perhaps too much concern about people who are fully vaccinated being able to transmit the virus. It can occur, but how often it occurs and who is it only in symptomatic people? These, these remain really very important questions that aren't answered. So because there's so much unknown, drilling down to the second question you had for Art about what would I do in the classroom? Um, I'm gonna teach, um, if they're gonna allow me to, I'm gonna teach uh, virtually. Um, I don't see any reason why I should add that risk. I'm well over 65 and even though I'm fully vaccinated and even though I'll be wearing a mask and everybody else will have a mask on and hopefully almost all of those folks will be vaccinated. I don't see any reason why I should add any risk on to, um, uh, to my daily activities. So that's the approach I'm gonna take. Got it. Guy, let me come to you and ask, I know you sit on in some of the committees and, and bodies that are reviewing and contemplating campus policy. Um, where do things stand currently? Is, do you, is there a reevaluation going on of what the directives will be for faculty and opt in, opt out? Give us, what's the current state of play? Yeah, well, this, it's a perfect time for the question right after Art and, uh, and John's <laughs> answers, <laughs> because it shows the, it, it shows the, the varied um, approach that people take. And, and I think the best medical advice outside of, a, outside of um, employment, outside of a campus, is people are, need to assess their own risk, their own level of risk tolerance, just like Art and John perfectly described their own thinking through their approach. And our challenge as a campus is to come up with a policy that allows one to, to have a reasonable um, uh, risk tolerance assessment for themselves, knowing all that they know about themselves and their personal situation, which the campus can't know all of everybody's uh, personal situation and still have a functioning campus uh, that is uh, doing, per participating in its mission. And what we heard from, from faculty, the pedagogical experts, is that in-person instruction is invaluable. And so we're trying to design a campus that can do all of these things. Well, I, I'm not sure if we're going to, to land in the porridge is just right for everybody, but, I, but we are uh, trying to figure out a way to have some sort of personal risk assessment and tolerance and still have uh, folks default to in-person instruction. That's the best answer I have right now for, for yeah. campus. And UCOP is struggling with it. This is not a situation that's unique to, to, to Cal. This is yeah. for, to, to UC Berkeley. It is system-wide. Yeah, so let's... Guy, let me stay with you for a couple of more questions, but as we go along, if other people want to jump in, please just raise your hand up. Um, we're talking a lot about masks and vaccines. We have a vaccine mandate on campus requirement to wear masks. How are we going to enforce the mandate, the vaccine mandate, and how are we going to enforce masks? Are professors going to get it? Every classroom will have a supply. How's that going to work a couple of weeks from now? Well, I... I I think we're rightfully um, um, relying on a highly educated, a um, compassionate and, and community-minded um, campus to do what is right. And right now what the campus has said is right is uh, we are going to uh, have a mask mandate inside and of course the vaccine mandate. This does rely on the honor system to a great degree, much like the rest of student the student conduct policy, there's a lot of honor system built in. There are also some safety nets. So certainly on the student, faculty, and, and uh, staff side, UHS um, is, is 
for protecting this information because it is protected uh, personal health information. And we will know um, who, who is compliant with the policy and who isn't. And certainly there will be some auditing um, of facilities, much like EHS does audits of uh, for all kinds of things, including infection control. There will be audits of facilities. Um, and then, of course, the other uh, safety net, frankly, is is um, the the people cards and, and campus badge. We have we can't fully implement that because it just takes too many people to to be checking every single door, every entrance and exit to every facility. But, but there will be, uh, you know, we do have ways to ramp up the, the compliance and enforcement if we really need to. I really don't think we will. I, I trust our, our campus to a great degree to really do what's right. And then we can, th those folks that are adamant about not doing what's right, we can, we can figure that out. What about the mass distribution issue? Are they going to be decentralized? Will it be every building? Has a, how's that going to work? Yeah, it's my understanding that campus still has a large supply of, of masks, uh, of, I should call them face coverings, of face coverings and of uh, some, some KN95 uh, masks for, for faculty, staff, and students. So if anybody shows up at a, a place that doesn't have a mask, we should, we should have that. I don't know how long that's going to go on. If people are using them at a high rate, we, we may run low, but we've got a lot of masks right now. Yeah, I, I want to go back. On, we're going to come back to campus issues, but just in response to some of the questions that are going to go or that are coming in, I want to go broader and go back to our um, uh, epidemiologists for this. Students are many students are going to have to travel back. What's your assessment of how safe travel is to get on a plane for a couple of hours? Again, wearing a mask, not knowing what the status vaccination status is of the person sitting next to you. Is that something to be trepidatious about, John? Oh, I think um, you should be should have trepidation about travel. Um, it's not just the plane, of course, it's the airport and it's the way to get to the airport and then from the airport back to wherever you're going. Um, that said, I think you can protect yourself very well um, by wearing a good mask or double masking. All right, Let me stop you. What's a what's a good mask? To just find a good say, mask my preference, my preference would be an N95 mask if I was on a plane. Um, I would uh, have eye covering. Um, I would uh, try and sit next to the window if I could. Um, I wouldn't be drinking or eating on the plane. I would do all the sa same things we've been doing for the last year and a half. Uh, but I think you can you can make yourself um, a pretty safe, a pretty safe situation by doing those things. Um, and the students have to travel, so the it's it, again it's the calculus that you take. But I don't think it's a highly risky enterprise. Um, Art, I have an epidemiological question for you as well. I've been struck by the number of times I've gone out here to Tilden Park or, geez, even at the beach out at Stinson, winds blowing 20 knots, people are masked up. Um, last summer, I remember there was sort of a general understanding that being outside, that there were almost no cases, it wasn't really dangerous. But I see on campus, and my son's going back to Berkeley High in a week. The kids are being told to mask up outdoors. What's going on in terms of the outdoor situation? Has something changed or is this an overreaction in your opinion? What's going on with that? And again, here too, what's the prudent advice? So I'm not sure who's recommending masking in an outdoor setting. Uh, you know, my general uh, belief uh, based on the data and, and what I think is the policy in most places is that masking outdoors is really uh, not necessary. Uh, now, if you're, in a, if you're in a very crowded space with large numbers of revelers uh, crowded together at a motorcycle rally or something in South Dakota uh, uh, or, or a huge music festival, uh, then maybe it makes sense in that setting. But to be taking a stroll in Tilden Park uh, or, or uh, sitting by a stream on campus uh, the reality is that that we don't really think transmission uh, in that setting is is very likely. Uh, it in part is a question of the properties of the virus. It's in part a question of the infectious dose. Um, there, there's really very little evidence of transmission uh, in in a setting like that. So I think for people to put on their mask when they go into a building and keep it on in the building, um, but but to feel relatively comfortable taking it off when they're outside is a very rational thing to do. Uh, Professor Schwartzberg, do you confer, concur? Not that I'm trying to set up some sort of uh, pro and con issue here. 
Well, I, I did want to point out that Art was flying a lot sooner than I was, but he had a very good reason for it in terms of his new grandchildren. Yeah. Um, uh, but I completely agree about outside. I carry a mask with me when, when I go outside, but I can't think of a time when I've had to put it on. I'll put a fine point on it, Dan. I just walked up to Cal Hall um, and I was in, inside the building. I had my mask on. As soon as I got outside, I peeled my mask off and just carried it with me up to uh, Cal Hall. Felt perfectly comfortable doing that. There just isn't that evidence as everybody has said that there's- You know, Dan, there. I, I would just point out for the, the single most infectious communicable disease we know of, measles, uh, which is much more uh, transmissible than SARS-CoV-2. Uh, there's no evidence of outside transmission for that virus either that I know of. So, so I just think outdoor transmission, except in really, really cramped circumstances, is just nothing people should put at the top of their worry list. That, that sort of raises, thanks for that, really helpful and reassuring. Um, but it raises another question that's come in, Guy. What, what we plan to have in-person football games again? That's sort of a congregate setting. It's outdoors, on the other hand. Are we going to insist that people be masked up when they come to those games? It's my understanding. So there are some Pac-12 guidelines and NCAA guidelines. And it's my understanding, and, and I may be wrong on the edges of this, but it's my understanding that... Um, when you buy your ticket for, for a football game this year, you will attest to your vaccination status. There will be a mask certainly off, offered at, you know, at uh, the gate is what I've heard. And um, if there, I, there are indoor elements to the stadium, of course, and True. when you're indoors, you will be masked. Got it. Um, and let me ask you a little bit about testing. So a number of questions are coming in about that. And, and I still want to be clear, why are we testing as much as we're testing, given that we've got an 80, 85 percent vaccination rate in terms of the campus population? Um, first, I just have to add my two cents to the football Please, game, which is I would wear a mask if I was in the crowded bleachers with a bunch of people shouting under the influence of alcohol. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a there's a reality check. And, and, you know, speaking to the outdoor masking, the school districts are requiring outdoor masking, I would say mainly because it'd be impossible to police kids putting them on and off all day long mm. going in and out of hallways, and that younger folks are less likely to be vaccinated. So there is a bit of a contradiction in that. And I have a kid going back to Berkeley High, too. So, you know, we're all crossing our fingers. Um, the testing. So, you know, first of all, this is a really big campus, right? We have more than 60,000 people associated with this campus. So even if you have 10% who are not vaccinated, that's six, still 6,000 people per week getting tested, right? So um, just take that part alone. I mean, I'd love to think that we'll get to higher than 90% vaccination, but, you know, we shall see. Um, in addition, we have a lot of stuff going on. We have a lot of people with symptoms. Doesn't mean they have COVID, but people are getting their old colds back. We didn't see anyone with a cold last year. They have them now. We have people coming in with the usual stuff. And frankly, we're expecting a really busy fall because I do think, and we know based on our contact tracing, that people have far more contacts now than they did before. So. We're seeing a slew of people with respiratory symptoms. And of course, every single person with a respiratory symptom needs a COVID test. So that's a lot of testing. Um, and then there's all the contacts. So um, we've had a lot more people with more than 10 contacts of our cases, even with five to 10 cases per day, which is what we've been having, which is a lot more than the spring, that's leading to about 100 contacts. So those people need testing. So there's a lot of testing that is going to be happening not just as part of pure asymptomatic surveillance, but also because of mild symptoms that may or may not be COVID and the context of those folks. And then, as I mentioned, let's just say that everyone stopped testing, which I was worried was going to happen this spring, that people were just not getting tested anymore. Well, then we lose a handle on the epidemiology in terms of the emerging variants. And since we know that COVID can be so asymptomatic or very mild symptoms, especially in, in the vaccinated folks, you can't really make any assumptions about how we're doing until it's too late. And obviously what too late means is, you know, a month after we get an uptick in cases, if we get hospitalizations and deaths, and we really want to catch it earlier than that. Somebody asked, is there a limit on how many times one can get tested at UHS? 
it's not i'll just quietly say it's not set up automatically to limit you but if people get tested three times a week on a regular basis i do hear about it and we try to figure out what we can do to support that person and another question what about rapid testing is that something that we should anticipate coming soon to campus so we actually have some rapid testing. Rapid testing doesn't really mean anything by itself. It just means quick. Um, we have rapid PCR testing, which is not what most people think of when they speak to rapid. So anyone who has symptoms, who's a contact, gets tested here at UHS, and we get the result back within an hour um, using a platform that's different from our surveillance testing. And then in addition, we actually are going to start doing rapid um, antigen testing, which is a less sensitive and specific test, specifically to help sort infectious risk for people coming into healthcare. So rapid testing has a place. It's just the place is not an, an equal replacement to the PCR testing that's the gold standard. So Gaia, I'm curious. Um, there's a couple of questions that allude to this as sort of, I don't know if it's correct to describe you as the chief clinician for the campus, but you obviously oversee our clinical services. Are there any tools that we're lacking that you wish we had in terms of surveillance, monitoring, vaccines, testing, masking, or do you think, are you feeling confident as we're two weeks away from the start of the semester? Well, I mean, in pure honesty, yeah, there's a couple tools that we, that other, campuses or universities are using with some success. I'm not sure that we would have a different outcome to be completely honest. The one thing that comes to my mind right now is that, that a, a couple of other campus have infrastructure that is more suited to wastewater testing. Mm. Our, our wastewater testing, um, while we do have a couple of sites that we've been monitoring, um, is imperfect, and it's not because the lab isn't good. It's not because the the, the principle of wastewater testing isn't good. Um, frankly, it's just the the way the the sewers were set up and the way the pipes were set up when buildings were constructed, and the the way the the university was constructed doesn't lend itself well to the the type of wastewater testing that you hear about in some of the other campuses that were able to impo implement more uh, widespread testing. Um, that, that's probably uh, high on the list. I can't think of another thing. Let me let, let me answer it this way. The campus has has been incredibly um, thoughtful and and I think um, farsighted in its approach to COVID response. Meaning, when we need more contact tracers, we go get more contact tracers. When when we need more IT folks to to handle that. Not that it's easy to hire folks in today's world, but but the campus has been very uh, good about uh, thinking about these kinds of needs and, and COVID response for the greater public good. You know, you and mentioned- then, Can I, please, sorry, can go I ahead. just chime in on the question of surveillance and testing please. and variance? Because, you know, I think there may be a little bit of a misconception there uh, that we're really not doing very much of this and that if, if the campus isn't doing a lot of it, we'll be uh, missing. Uh, things in the community or could be entering the campus. In point of fact, uh, I'm involved in one large project with the Alameda County and Contra Costa San Francisco counties where we monitor uh, and, and test for variants. Uh, number one, uh, that's focused on hospitalized individuals in the three counties. But but in addition, uh, if, if I get this proposal in by tomorrow to a major foundation, uh, we're going to be working with all of the Kaiser uh, Northern California um, and it's almost 5 million members uh, and, and monitoring all, co all, all positive COVID tests and testing them for variants, uh, including in outpatients. So I, th I think it's a little bit of a, of a misunderstanding that we're not doing a lot of testing and, and looking for variants in the, in the community. That's really not true. Got it. Um, thank you, Art. Um, Guy, I want to come back to you about another, you mentioned infrastructure. One of the other things, questions that's popping up has to do with window openings and air circulation. We've got old infrastructure, as we know, and there's concern here that not all classes have windows that can be opened and not and wondering if we're going to have HEPA filters in each classroom. What do we know about that? What can you share and how concerned should we be? Yeah, I, I, the folks at the EHS are probably much more suited to answer this question than I. Here's here's what here's the limited amount that I know that that the classrooms were prioritized uh, based on an assessment. I, I 
believe that we had um, facility between facilities, a vendor and EHS look at the, the high volume classrooms, I think, and high density classrooms, and tried to sort those by, by ventilation status. I, I do think it is true that some of the buildings on campus are old and, and the ventilation doesn't stack up to, to a newer building. I think that's pretty safe to say. Opening windows where you can is an obvious response when you can, where you can. Um, that, that is one thing that we, you know, we're, we're lucky in some buildings that have operable windows. Um, I don't know the status of HEPA filters or any of the other aspects of that question. So I just want to mention now for folks who are tuning in, the, the questions are fantastic and they obviously run the full range here. And I don't think there's any group of experts could, that could ever hope to answer everyone's questions. However, um, we have an excellent website. I'm gonna ask my friends at ETS to pop the address up on the screen before we go on. That's coronavirus.berkeley.edu. It is constantly updated with highly detailed information. Um, everything from where to go to get where you need to go to get tested to how you resupply personal protection equipment if you may have run out in your department or office. So, Please, if you're quick, we don't get to your question, um, or if by some chance it's a question the panelists are unable to answer, uh, consult that website and don't uh, don't hesitate to forward along questions if you don't find what you're looking for there. Um, I want to come back to Art and John for this next one. We're gonna we're gonna keep bouncing back and forth and try to satisfy as many people as possible. We're gonna get broader here again, and that's about booster shots. Um, Eighty percent of us have been vaccinated, and it's Getting, we're getting to that six month period or we're getting up, coming close to that six month period. I've been, since we've been vaccinated um, for many of us, starting to see some coverage that people are getting boosters, maybe just for immunocompromised. What's the booster? What's the booster situation and what's your own recommendation? John, if I could start with you. Sure. Well, the um, ACIP is meeting this Thursday. Could you say what that is, please? I'm sorry. That's the advisory committee to uh, the CDC. It's going to advise the CDC on a variety of things relative to COVID and on their agenda um, is the question of booster shots. Um, I would not, I will not be surprised if, if um, we have a, a statement from the committee Thursday that they're, they're going to recommend for immunocompromised patients a booster shot. Um, when I say a booster, I'm talking about from Moderna or Pfizer. Um, I'm going to call out J and J for now. Um, they, I think that the other groups that uh, will be discussed, but I'm not. Sh I, I would be surprised if there's any statement about it. Will be for older people, people over 65 who are at increased risk for a bad outcome, um, and uh, for people with. Uh, chronic lung disease, chronic heart disease, diabetes, um, groups of other group, uh, severe obesity, groups of people who are, are also at risk for a bad outcome. I don't think we'll be hearing anything from the from uh, ACIP this week, but I think that uh, that's gonna be, continue to be discussed. But let me frame it a little differently, Dan. You know, uh, this time last year, we were hoping for a vaccine. The FDA said if it was 50%, showed 50% efficacy, we would they would approve it. I was hoping for 70%. You know, we got something in the 90s. Um, not only did we get something in the 90s for preventing hospitalization and uh, death, but we got uh, something in the 90s that up until the Delta variant clearly prevented transmission that is, if I was fully vaccinated and got reinfected, I wouldn't transmit. As a matter of fact, I probably wouldn't get reinfected. So, it, and, and you rarely saw breakthrough infections. So up until Delta, this was not an issue. Um, now what's an issue with Delta, and we I briefly mentioned this earlier, is can a fully vaccinated person transmit? And we have hints that that may be the case. Again, from the province down, uh, uh, MMW morbidity mortality weekly report from a week ago Friday. Um, again, we need a lot more data about that. So uh, the it's been disappointing, but I think we got greedy. 
I think, you know, remember what we wanted. We wanted to see a decrease in hospitalizations. We wanted to see a, a reduction in deaths. We wanted to see a dramatic reduction in both of those things. And we still get this with the vaccines. We're not seeing a big uptick in uh, deaths from Delta, except in those people who are not vaccinated. We're not seeing a big uptake in hospitalizations from Delta, except in those people who are not vaccinated. So the vaccines are really achieving what we want. Um, right now, I don't feel anxious about not, be, not getting a booster. I'm not gonna stand in line. I'm not gonna surreptitiously get a booster. I'm gonna wait and see what the data continues to show. Uh, right now, I'm pleased with my protection level. Uh, there was a paper that was just published just, a, I think, yesterday or the day before that showed high levels of neutralizing antibodies in patients who uh, and people who were fully vaccinated 13 months ago. So, um, you know, I think that we've been laying crepe for uh, the vaccines much too soon. I think they're work still working incredibly well. Mark, do you want to add to that? No, I think John uh, said it all quite well. I think we're not going to know for a while whether uh, uh, people need boosters or, or, or not uh, outside of the group, such as the immunocompromised, perhaps the extremely uh, old, um, where, where it's certainly possible that there'll be a recommendation for an additional dose. But I think whether or not we'll need boosters to cover additional variants, whether we'll need boosters to uh, continue to protect us over an extended period of time is really the subject of ongoing uh, studies. Um, you know, I would simply point out, and this, you know, gets complicated, but uh, some may know the Director General of the World Health Organization has dissuaded, uh, tried to dissuade wealthy countries from giving routine booster doses and shipping those extra doses to poor countries that, that, where nobody's had any, even their first dose. So there's a sort of a global health equity issue um, that, that has arisen. And I would just say that at the moment, under current guidelines and laws, um, healthcare providers are really not supposed to be administering boosters um, of this uh, vaccine that has been paid for by your tax dollars uh, through the federal government. Uh, some providers apparently are going to do that, uh, but at the moment it's really not officially sanctioned. Um, Guy, I'm going to come to I'm going to come to you for a second. When I want the next set of questions, really to focus on students, which we haven't talked enough about yet. But before I do, Art and John, I want to ask you a question that may be unfair. But for the vaccinated, is there any way you can compare the peril that faces somebody who's currently vaccinated, who's out and about, wearing masks, maybe sitting in a classroom, going to grocery shopping, walking to the flu season? Is it more dangerous? I mean, in the flu season, we know there are a number of fatalities that tens of thousands of people die every year from the flu where you haven't been masked up in the past. How do you, how can you help us understand the current peril as compared to other forms of peril in an epidemiological sense that we have readily accepted in the past? John, does, you well, I'll just say ahead. something very briefly, which is it's complicated in part uh, because flu vaccines don't work very well, right. um, uh, frankly. Uh, they're, they're the best prevention we have for flu, so I strongly recommend them, but they in reality come nowhere close to what John was talking about in terms of efficacy of the annual flu shot. So, so we know that the COVID vaccine is vastly better in terms of its efficacy uh, that, that, than flu vaccine. Uh, you know, interestingly, as many people know, last year we had almost no influenza. Uh, and whether that's because the virus was taking a nap uh, or whether that's because of all the masking and social distancing, I think we're gonna find out this winter. Um, but but, but um, so it's a little hard to compare the two. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends in part on which flu viruses are circulating and, and how good the flu vaccine is that year. Okay. Yeah, you know, I I, um, I have been terrified by influenza my entire career. I was expecting the next great pandemic not to be a coronavirus, which I, um, which with the exception of SARS and MERS, I just didn't think was, would cause anything like this. Um, but I've I've been convinced I've convinced myself over all these years that it was going to be influenza that was going to be the next great catastrophe for, for the world, just like it was in 1918, 1919. And I still worry about it. I worry about it a great deal. Um, but Art's absolutely 
I, I completely agree with Art. Um, it's, it's very hard to predict exactly what's going to happen with influenza and COVID. It's going to be very problematic for um, Anna and her group um, because, as she was saying earlier, uh, people are going to come in with symptoms with of influenza or COVID and they're going to look exactly the same. Yeah. Just a quick comment there. Our rapid test actually tests for influenza, COVID, and RSV just for fun. So we'll be gathering that information as people come in. Got it. And, um, and I would just want to add one quick thing, and I want to see if, if Anna, Art, and, and John agree. I think one of the, I'm, I'll, I'm looking for silver linings a, a lot. And I think one of the other silver linings is that, that um, we, society, humankind has now developed a, a, a novel kind of vaccine that has been very um, efficacious in humans. And wouldn't it be an amazing silver lining if we could improve the influenza vaccine mm. uh, based on recent technology and some of these other vaccines that frankly, I mean, 40% is there, you know, so it's, we're, we're light years ahead of where we were, um, you know, with that in mind, I'd love to hear their comments. Got it. So Guy, let me stay with you and let's let's focus on students for a bit. Um, what ex we're being asked, what exactly happens? The student comes in, tests positive. What happens immediately after? What, what happens with the roommates? What happens with the students? What goes on? Well, the answer is that anybody that's positive is, uh, is, is isolated. That's a public health order. Um, and if the student happens to live on campus, I'll let Anna go in, in great detail here because she knows the intricacies of, of campus isolation and quarantine. But essentially, um, that, that, that positive is isolated and we start contact the case investigation and contact tracing process. Um, hopefully we don't uncover too many contacts, but when we do, we, we follow protocol and quarantine those that need quarantine, test them at five days, and, and so on. Anna, do you want to go into great detail? Uh, not great detail because I could go on all day, but I will add that the, the thing that's interesting right now is that per the current CDC and CDPH, as well as local public health guidance, we don't actually quarantine vaccinated people who are identified as contacts. And a lot of contact tracers are struggling a little bit with that because we know we are seeing some breakthrough cases. So there's an interesting shift happening right now where um, both because of that and capacity issues, we're really prioritizing quickly identifying any unvaccinated close contacts um, and then also reaching out to vaccinated contacts to make sure that they know they need to stay alert for symptoms. And we are recommending, which we weren't a month or two ago, we are recommended testing, as Guy mentioned, at five days afterwards. And frankly, if I were a vaccinated close contact, I would stay away from my immunocompromised family members. I mean, there's a little bit of this gray area happening right now in that work, but it's it's uh, we've been doing this for a long time. Um, it's going to be a big fall because the contacts, as I said, are much, much higher. And we'll be doing a lot more to sort of blanket, um, you know, for example, a building on campus. We've had a couple of building on campuses where we had little clusters. We'll just send out a notice to everybody there saying, hey, FYI, this is going on. Please remain alert. If you are unvaccinated, reach out. If you're vaccinated, get tested. So um, it'll be a little different than the past where we are drilling down into every detail on every single case. Got it. And the question came in from a student's father and says, uh, my child's roommate is unvaccinated. Does that pose additional threat for their fellow vaccinated students? And I have two questions. How is it that the roommate is unvaccinated? Um, or is that just something we're accepting that there's going to be a certain percentage? And what is, what is the threat posed right. by that unvaccinated individual? So the first question, there will be people who are not vaccinated who have had an approved exception uh, for the UC policy. And so that may include people in the dorms. I will say that we have strongly been advising the people who are immunocompromised or have who have serious medical issues, consider that and they make their decisions, right? When they come and live in, a, in the dorms or any other congregate settings, the percentage will be very low, but there will be people who are unvaccinated. Um, we are also ha reinforcing that really people shouldn't be asking their roommates what their vaccine status is because that is a you know private health information. But let's be real and know that people will share that information, right? So, 
risk to the vaccinated person? Well, the risk is still much higher to the unvaccinated person from everything that they go through than the vaccinated one, right? So the the unvaccinated roommate, by virtue of being unvaccinated, is, I'd say, at more risk from everything they're doing, potentially even including their vaccinated roommate, it's hard to know, um, than the vaccinated person is. But, you know, it would have been worse, what's the other alternative, to put a whole bunch of unvaccinated people together who have no immunity at all, where it would spread like wildfire really quickly. So there's some tough decisions that, you know, every campus has had to make in approaching this challenge. Can you give us a, you mentioned it, and maybe you could expand just a little bit. What are the exceptions to the vaccination mandate? So the UCOP policy has a number of approved exceptions, um, both for students, faculty, and staff. The first one is the medical exception, and that has to be based by policy only on CDC listed contraindications or precautions or those listed in the package insert. And realistically, there are very few of those. You really have had to have had essentially an anaphylactic reaction to um, that vaccine or another vaccine, because that's a precaution. Um, and there's a few other details too, but the vast majority um, of folks who have concerns do not meet that, that criteria. They will not be able to get a medical exception. Next one is disability exception. So you can get a certification from your provider that you have a disability. That means that you should not get the vaccine. I'll be upfront and say that's going to be an iterative conversation with between disability and employees and students because we want to make sure people are well informed. And there are very few of those thus far. And then there is a deferral. If you're pregnant and you wish to avoid getting the vaccine, you may request a deferral. I will say I think people should get the vaccine if they're pregnant, but I understand having been pregnant that it's a difficult decision. And so at least with students, I'm, I'm engaging with them directly and advising. Um, and then the last one is religious uh, belief and a strongly had religious belief is part of the policy. So people are able to get an exception for that reason as well. You know, you mentioned students with disabilities and there was a question about that particular uh, portion of our community and that is whether they will lose or be able to hold on to the accommodations they gain during the period of remote instruction. Do you know the answer to that, Anna? Let me just first say that if people come forward with a COVID vaccine for disability, then disability services gets involved and will ensure that they get whatever accommodations they need. In terms of automatically losing something they had before, that seems unlikely, but I'd have to pass it to Guy. Guy? I don't know the answer. No problem. Um, Art and John, I want to come back to you with another difficult one. We've been talking about the Delta virus the entire time, but they're trying to make its way onto the front page of newspapers is the Lambda variant. What can you tell us about that? Um, some of the initial things I've read about it, at least in mainstream media, were quite concerning. Can you help those of us who are just becoming familiar with this development? Well, I'll just make two quick comments and then I'll let John weigh in. So, so first of all, um, uh, the, the, these coronaviruses mutate all the time. Uh, there will be an ongoing profusion of, of uh, variants. So, um, uh, you know, stay tuned because if it isn't Lambda this week, it'll be uh, Omega next week or whatever it is. So, um, uh, you know, the, the, whatever variant we're on this week, we, we will have more. Uh, number one. And, and number two, uh, although John may know more than I do, at the moment, I don't know of any evidence. And I think the, the, the key question fundamentally is whether uh, these mutants, these variants can escape vaccine induced protection. Um, and, you know, clearly we're worried if they make people more sick, if they're more transmissible. Uh, so far, these have been issues primarily in the unvaccinated. But, but I think the key issue we need to, to monitor is whether some uh, vaccine escape mutant develops that where, in fact, the vaccine-induced immunity really doesn't work. And I don't know of any evidence of that so far for the Lambda. But, but John, what about you? Yeah, Lambda, thanks, Art. Um, Lambda caused and is causing a terrible problem in South America, particularly in Peru. It's, it's the dominant variant there. And it's caused an awful lot of cases, a lot of hospitalizations and a lot of deaths. So very disconcerting. Interestingly, while it's been around since last December, it's never made profound headway here in the United States. It, it is 
uh, does not seem to be able to outcompete Delta. As a matter of fact, Delta seems to outcompete it, but it's the next in line of concern. It, um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of science about um, Lambda. We know the mutations, particularly in what's called the receptor binding domain. It's got one, the uh, K417N that's, that's of great concern uh, in terms of transmissibility. But that said, um, the depth of our science about Lambda is not as great as it needs to be. In terms of what we know, it appears to be quite transmissible. We're not sure if it's as transmissible as Delta. Um, it does not appear to cause more serious illness, but that data is soft. So too many questions about Lambda, but you know, as Art was alluding to, what worries me or keeps me up at night is not Lambda, it's, it's the next one. It's the unknown unknown. And um, you know, the one that's out there that's maybe in halfway around the world and we haven't even seen it yet, that could be completely resistant to the immunity we get from our vaccines. That's, that's what keeps me up at night. Got it. Um, Guy, John's answer offers a perfect segue to my next question. And that is if you could talk a little bit about what sort of um, resources um, and assistance will be available for people who are going to have trouble dealing with stress and anxiety. Um, particularly, you know, in some ways it's, you know, after being told it might be safe to get back in the water and the, rever the current reversal, um, I can imagine stress and anxiety at all times high at all times, all time highs. How are we set up to deal with that? What do you want people to know? Yeah, well, certainly we've been addressing this really uh, starting late spring and early summer as we thought we were, as Anna mentioned, we thought maybe we were further ahead than we really were. And so we were expecting, you know, a, a return to campus uh, in fall. That said, um, for employees, our employee assistance program certainly is available, very knowledgeable about um, the current situation and return to work and, and addressing people's um, rational fears and, and at sometimes irrational fears uh, about this, this situation. For students, um, you know, our, our CAPS and social services, our behavioral health providers are ready to, to serve. That's, that's why we're here. And so, you know, students uh, can, can access us in person, can access re us remotely. And, and there is a lot of talk about the, the, on the behavioral side, on the psychological side, the echo pandemic, where we're, we're, we're ready for, and this, this happens after major wars, other major disasters, um, that there's a, a bit of a lag, a, a bit of a delay, but then the stress and anxiety, depression, wow. depressive symptoms, um, then are the second wave. And in our case, I don't know, the fifth, sixth, how many waves have we been through so far? It's, it's wave X. Um, and, and so we're, we're certainly um, conceptually prepared, but we don't know, we don't know what the demand is going to be. So. I'll so now at the other side of the emotional spectrum, which is celebration and in general and more particular parties, number of questions about whether we're going to allow them, assuming we even have the ability to keep students from partying, what we're going to be communicating, what your level of concern is, Guy, about the extent to which students may be congregating, partying, drinking, snacking, masks off and all that comes with it. What are we gonna do and what are we thinking? Oh, that is a constant, that is a constant concern and that's, that predates COVID. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll just point to a couple, the things that are coming to my mind and I'll, and I'll pass it off to Anna to see if she has um, more intelligent things to, to say about it than I do. But, but what comes to mind is, that um, again, most people are doing, are, are, are acting in a responsible way. And that includes students. Even though we had, um, I'll say highly publicized uh, groups of students um, participating in social events that at the time were not a wise idea at the very least, um, that, that we, we ha had very good, um, I'll say compliance with it. For those that are that egregious, um, we've also seen the very real example of not only UHS stepping in, but our city and, and county public health officers stepping in and ordering 
certain things. And I do not want it to get back to, to the state where we we literally have to order th- you know order something to happen, meaning testing, stopping parties, enforcement, um, in, including at times, unfortunately, the police had to get involved. Anna, what else? What else should I be saying? What else should we be saying about that? Just keep it outside. Is all I can say. Keep it outside and think twice before you share a drink. Right, I mean, but really- it sounds. It sounds like we won't, as we have not in the past. We will not hesitate to take pretty concerted action if we think there's a threat to student health, public health, at all. Right? Yeah, to public health. I mean, this is this is why we do what we do. And sometimes, as Anna mentioned, there's a lot of gray areas in all of this, but but we try to do what's right and responsible for the campus. All right, we're just, we're really at at closing time. I'm gonna go around really quickly, just some some closing thoughts. Um, It's really remarkable. We've reached maybe two thirds of the questions, but an incredible number of questions that I think are evidence of a pretty significant degree of concern. But Art, let me come to you first for a closing thought or two. So, so I would just say that you know I certainly have family members who have anxieties about uh, the COVID nineteen and what's safe to do, and I spend a lot of time on the phone advising family members about various things. So I fully get that that, that this is causing a lot of anxiety in a lot of quarters, parents of students, students themselves, faculty and staff. So I have a lot of sympathy for that, um, but but I'm I'm cautiously optimistic that that we, we will be able to have the campus open, uh, highly vaccinated, uh, and operating uh, safely uh, for this coming academic year. So that's my prediction. Thanks, John. Um, get vaccinated. <laughs> you know, uh, my line, John. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's we. We, we do lots of things and we've done a lot of things really well on this campus, but um, the most important thing everybody can do is just get vaccinated. It, it's, it's your layer of protection that supersedes everything else. And the other thing I'd say is that, you know, I, I've, I've watched what our campus has done throughout this pandemic. And for a campus of this size, 60,000 people, um, I, I think we've done remarkably well. And I think that we're poised to do remarkably well in very difficult times. We're trying to, we're going to open up this campus in two weeks to all these people, students, staff, and faculty. And I think um, I, have, I have tremendous confidence in the people who are, who are steering the ship. Anna. Um, I share Art's cautious optimism. I'd like people to take a moment to celebrate all the things they can do and to get outside and get some fresh air and just not to forget all the lessons we've learned. That's good advice. That's great advice. Guy, final word. Oh, I don't, how can I follow that? That was perfectly <laughs> said. Um, let me just throw quick quick data. The, the, the reinfection rate uh, for folks that um, have been previously infected, um, even with the variants, it is worse for people that have not been vaccinated. Said another way, if you've been infected, your na- your natural immunity, it looks like, is not better than if you get vaccinated. Mm. And it's just another plug, I suppose, that all four of us are going to be somewhat biased in our in our approach to this, that the vaccines are the answer. Um, for, for the, the the great segment of the population. And we do have to think globally on this one because that's where the variants are emerging. Um, so I'll stop there, get vaccinated. I wanna, I wanna thank, I wanna thank all of you again. Don't take it personally when I say, I really hope we start, stop meeting like this, um, but your guidance and your wisdom around these issues has been profoundly helpful. I know we've seen the emails, the community campus community, I know deeply appreciates it and we appreciate your time. So thank you. And as we go out, again, we're gonna have up on the screen for everybody, the website, the campus website that's constantly updated. Um, You'll find all sorts of detailed information there. Um, We urge you to look at it carefully and constantly, particularly as we approach the beginning of the fall semester. And with that, um, let me wish everybody a good evening, stay healthy, stay well and be safe and get vaccinated. Thank you.